further humbling me. I think I've, I've been quite humbled by the, the presentations today. I think they're absolutely fantastic depth and scope uh, and so on. So uh, I hope I don't bring it down too much of a level. Um, but what I want to talk to you about today is some work I've been doing around charisma. I've been interested for some time in the idea of charisma, particularly in relation to sports people uh, and martial artists. But the, the key problem with charisma is, is the body and how we factor the body into charismatic performances. So today's a little bit of a uh, bit of a paper I've I've written uh, and I'm working on, so I'm interested in some feedback on some of the, some of the elements. What I'll do briefly, and I apologise for this, but it needs to be done, is to look a little bit at the charisma theory um, and how I'm trying to bring notions of effect in uh, and how I'm trying to bring the idea of the body in. Okay? And then what I'll do is look at Bruce Lee and try and illustrate that very briefly. Um, and I must say, I've scaled this back since I came to the first presentation and subsequent ones, realising the depth of your knowledge of Bruce Lee is far outstripping mine. I didn't need to give you detailed examples. I think we'll, you'll, you'll find those. So I'm just going to highlight a few things and I'll make a few concluding comments. Um, Thomas, in his biography of, of Lee, um, talks about Lee's charisma. He said Lee possessed a natural charisma, whatever that is, uh, that made him stand out from a crowd of even hundreds. And he also said, which really, really make me, make, made me sort of sit up and listen, he said, Bruce Lee inspired people. We know that. We're probably all here partly because of that. Okay, so Bruce Lee's in me as well, I'm sure. Um, but this idea of inspired is interesting because in charisma theory, charismatic leaders and inspired people go together. And the fact that this is being said by someone who's not using the theory about a person made me think, hang on, did someone write this theory for Bruce Lee? <laughs> okay. So the idea of embodying charisma, um, just a brief word there. The, many theories have been recast, according to Chris Schilling's work, it, uh, over the last couple of decades. Finding the body in social science and humanities, people go back, look at old theories, read the body into it, you know, what did Marx say about the body and so on. This has happened across the piece for many, many different theoretical approaches. Okay? But one that seems to have escaped attention in a significant way is, is Weber's charisma. Um, so I was, when I thought, oh, this is going to be easy, I'll just write about Bruce Lee and charisma, then I realised, well, the thing I want to touch on is his body and how he does it through his body. Uh, and there wasn't anything there to draw on. So that led me to where I'm at now. Um, so I want to look at a couple of aspects of that. Um, apologies if you're familiar with the idea. If not, then obviously, uh, okay. Weber said this, the theory of charisma is associated first and foremost with Max Weber, who took the idea um, from others, and he took the idea from its original usage as well. He said charismatic leaders have been holders of specific gifts of body and spirit. That's about as body-focused as he gets in the definition. And these gifts have been believed to be supernatural, not accessible to everybody. And one of the problems with that is that the idea of a supernatural charisma is clearly how the original term was used. Um, however, the key word here is uh, believed to be. As a sociologist, whether someone really is, has supernatural charisma or not is really a moot point. The fact is that if someone believes you have, that's where the game starts. Okay? So Weber clearly was tuned into this idea. Sociologically from there, the notion of charisma has generally been seen as a force for change. So in terms of Weber's notion of charismatic, or, sorry, of, of forms of authority, different forms of authority, traditional forms, bureaucratic forms and charismatic forms, um, this fits in. And the charismatic is seen as an agent of change, sometimes anarchic, usually breaking down traditional or bureaucratic orders, or at least challenging them. You can see my point. There's something here about this has been written for Lee or around him. But it wasn't, of course. It was written a long time ago. Um, so when I was searching through Weber's work for references to the body, they're few and far between. It's very scattered anyway, uh, given the way of writing. But I did find a number of references to this over, over a period of his work. Um, and you'll put me on the spot if you ask me where they came from. <laughs> But he does emphasize that charisma uh, must be constantly performed. Okay? So to be charismatic, you've got to perform it. You've got to do it. And you've got to do it constantly. Secondly, 
that it has to be recognised by others. So you have to provide a performance that someone else notices. We can all be incredibly charismatic in front of a bathroom mirror, you know, singing our favourite songs, but no one's going to notice that we're any good. You've got to get out there and you've got to be seen, and someone has got to turn around and be recognising that, be moved by it. Third, and I can't focus on this too much today because it would take too long, but the idea that charisma dies with the body of its bearer and being embodied, charisma is not readily transferable. This notion of transferring something uh, that is kind of uh, intangible to some extent. Okay, so I would argue that these are inherently embodied phenomena. The body is there, but it's, it, it's, it's an absent presence. It's implicit, as Chris Schiller would say. Okay, so... Those are some ideas around charisma. The next thing is I was trying to find a, a, a kind of framework through which I could look at the body. And I go back to Chris Schilling's work. I know George mentioned it earlier. We're rather fond of Chris's work because um, it's good. And, uh, but it, he, he came up with this idea of the body as source, location, and means for society. And what he means by that is that if you reduce all these different elements uh, of theorizing, the body gets represented as something that drives and makes society what it is. Okay? In other theory, the body gets seen as a location, a repository, a place where the society is written onto. Yeah? And if you look at still other theory, the body is seen as a, an active thing that is producing society. Okay? There's lo lots in there. But as a way of looking at uh, and categorising and schematising it, I found that quite useful. So I'll, I'll move on. And the final element here, which I'm trying to bring three things together is the notion of charismatic change through affect, okay? And the idea of affect, I've put it up here, is, that is one of the more interesting, perhaps, but also elusive concepts. This is Simicek's uh, simple definition. She says, what's meant by affect is felt stuff, which ranges from an intentional state, a feeling towards, about, or relation to something other to something that forms the background to felt experiences which shapes our subjective experience and engagement in the world. So effects started in Tomkin's rendition of effect as being a series of very specific biologically based emotions. Effect now has moved to be more uh, the, the process by which we are moved, not necessarily specific emotions themselves. There have been a number of, uh, I think, very useful, at least in this context, ideas around affect Effect is a process and not a system. It's not a, a great... You can harness it and you can deploy it and distribute it uh, to some extent. That is done, and there's some good work there on the kind of neoliberal moment and the, the economics of effect. But uh, inherently, it's a process, and it locks us all together in a relational way. Brian Masumi's work's very interesting around the, the way he characterises effect as body, movement, sensation, change, Okay. So anything that affects body through movement or into movement, then sensation, then change. So he's trying to put a schema there for how affect becomes a process. Lisa, uh, Lisa Blackman's work on uh, affective interpolation, you know, the way in which subjects are, are hailed in an affective sense, in an emotional sense, to a particular thing. They're brought to, brought to bear. There are many notions of collective effect, so it's not just an individual me-to-you thing, but... Masses of people can be involved clearly at the same time. This also connects with Nigel Thrift's non-representational idea of effective contagion, that we can share our effects. If you've ever got very scared because someone else is scared, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and more recently, Margaret Wetherill's work, very interesting um, in terms of her socio-psychological slant on affective practice, in the sense that all sets of practices have built into them affective aspects that move us, and they're designed to move us in some cases, okay? And they're designed to shape our emotional responses in certain situations. Okay, that's the dry stuff. Um, I've tried to put that together to give me a, a sensitizing sort of heuristic, if you like. So we've got body means, source location means, body must be performed and recognized, not focusing on those. Um, these ideas of effect, which I'm trying to just bring to my attention, and then, of course, some of the outcomes of effect might be, according to charisma theory, the notion of recognition, the notion of inspiration, and the notion of action. What I'm suggesting here is effect is required to make these things happen in people, okay? And it's, according to Masumi, infracorporeal. 
Which brings me to Lee. So I've got 10 minutes left for Lee. <laughs> okay, so trying to illustrate some of that stuff um, is, is quite tricky uh, in, in terms of texture analysis, I think sometimes, although I'm sure it's doable. Um, I'm not sure I'm good at it. But if we look at it, it helps us to categorize things uh, and look at how Lee was a charismatic leader that had a, a kind of embodied charisma and that we can say something about more than, yeah, he was charismatic. There are a number of things, if you look at his body of source, that stand out to me, and I'm really interested in your kind of take on this. One is that it's well known and well documented that he, he was small. He, his, his physical stature as a kid uh, you know, wasn't, wasn't very substantial. Okay? And for me, that really amplified his charismatic effect, is the embodied charisma, because his later physical accomplishments are made all the more impressive due to the place he started. Okay? If he was already a sort of fairly strapping mesomorphic lad that then turned into a behemoth, it might not have been so impressive. But because of where he came from, and because of his message, look at me, if you show, I can show you how to become like this too. Okay? Look, I've done it myself. So I think that's a significant part. For me, that's body of source. It's the body driving a situation that he's then um, responding to. As has been well documented by a number of speakers, his mixed ethnicity amplified his charismatic effect. Okay? <laughs> because it positioned him so often as, a, as an Asian, Caucasian other. You know, he was often liminal, wasn't he, in between these spaces. So he wasn't welcome here because of this. He wasn't welcome over here because of this. Um, and I think that affected, that was a, that his body, therefore, was a source for his uh, affecting others who related to that, but also a, a source for himself as well. These notions, you know, they, they, it, these, if people identify with these things, they're called towards it, okay, and, and collectively affected by these ideas. The final one is his training and his emerging philosophy, which was strongly emer emergent from his own combat experiences, okay, and of his performing body. So this notion of body movement sensation change, as George pointed out, the famous uh, one, so apparently one, but uh, not one in the way he wanted to win fight challenge match with Wong, um, led him to his body to give him the right sensations that actually I need to do something about this. Okay, so you could argue this is affect, which is making him change uh, in a, qu a qualitative sense. Okay. So as Lee evolves, his body becomes a location okay, for charisma and charismatic effect. I've put some pictures here. You can see this is a, this is quite, a, for me, I might be wrong, but that's a fencing stance. Yeah. Um, you know, the Wing Chun dummy, the boxing, and uh, as the French call it, the musculation, you know, the, the making your body muscular. All right. He, his body became a location for all these different things. Um, there are a couple that I'll point out. Obviously, the physique. And the physique has been pointed out. It's hard to miss. But I'm sure you would enlighten me that the genre of, of taking your shirt off in martial arts movies was, was really pioneered by Lee, I think. He might not have been the first. But certainly the way in which he did it and the way he put his body across on screen um, I don't know, it would be an interesting point. But certainly he made it his own, I think, in terms of that. And of course it's this source, this body that's come from somewhere which wasn't perfect in the first place that gives that powerful effect across. Look at this amazing body that's been constructed and built. Okay? Um, so as I've tried to summarise there, you know, it's a location for the effects of intense, culturally eclectic and functional martial arts training. Its effect was to inspire other bodies to be like this body. Okay, as we might call mirroring bodies. The second aspect we've spoken about endlessly and we will always do, uh, and you know, could he really do these things? I'm not interested in whether he could do these things. He showed us how uh, they might be done. He showed us how we might assemble these things. Okay? And I agree with the idea that uh, I think his films, in some way at least, were a montage of that idea, a, a form of teaching as well as entertainment. So his body becomes a location for martial art techniques. Okay? And, you know, we could have a, if I was doing it with students now, I'd be doing a spot the technique, but we, you're too, too well educated in these things. 
Um, but I'm, you know, these are famous now. The bar arm technique taken from judo, and you know, the cross, the crosses and jabs, the low kicks from Wing Chun, the high kicks possibly from Shaolin Kung Fu or from Taekwondo. It, um, you know, they could be a mixture. The wrestling techniques. I'm struck by the type of wrestling techniques. Um, in the opening scene of Enter the Dragon. Um, some, some great uh, rip-offs of WWE there, or forerunners, I think. You know, and so on. So his body becomes a location for a cross-cultural, multi-art skill repository. That's what, it, that's what it becomes. And outside of Ed Parker's Kenpo Karate, which was going on at the time, and there were similar things, similar ideas being developed there, he was unique. And clearly, the type of skill repository that he was looking at was new, and it was exciting because it encompassed the Chinese arts, not just mainly the Japanese arts. Okay? And it was also Western arts and Eastern arts. So Lee was in a unique position to be this kind of cosmopolitan martial artist, given his mixed ethnicity. OK, last one. Um, Body as means. Clearly, he used his films, and I'm very much as, as subscribed to this view, and his interviews and writing to try and uh, get across his, his charismatic idea. But he, he supported that with his body. It was underneath it. The body was always underpinning his ideas. And I'm going to try and squeeze this quoting. So I think it's a super example of how he used his charismatic body as a means to get followers and to get noticed. This is uh, Tom Tanbaum is, is in Thomas's biography. He came over to me and he said, I'm going to hold this catcher's mitt and you hit it. Now, I weighed about 200 pounds, and Bruce at the time weighed about 132. I hit it, and I hit it hard. Bruce said, now you hold it. Without even pulling his striking hand back and using just the torque of his body, he literally knocked me across the room. In fact, I hit the wall so hard that the picture fell down. It was embarrassing because all the students in the class looked at me. Still, I was fascinated because I'd never had a man who weighed almost 70 pounds less than me who could knock me across the room. Bruce said, that's the power. Now I'll show you the speed. He put a nickel in my palm and he said, close your fingers before I grab it, grab it out of your hand. He moved like lightning and I quickly clenched my fingers. And when I opened my hand, the nickel was gone and in its place was a dime. That's all I had to see. I said, that's fine. I said, I'm yours. So I started taking lessons from Bruce. <laughs> and that is the kind of archetypal example of, of the charismatic figure. You know, they do something, they perform, they get the recognition, they inspire and they get a follower. Right? And Lee used his body brilliantly in this regard. Okay. Another way he did it, last point, and then I'll conclude, um, is that he used his body to support his philosophy. So yes, perhaps his emerging philosophy affected, but this is, this is how effect works, isn't it? It's, it's two-way, always reciprocating each other. So he used his body as a means to support his ideas. Lee, as uh, Smith argues, all charismatic leaders need uh, a negative symbolism and a positive symbolism. In other words, they need something to fight against. They need something to rebel against, to be anarchic against. They need something to challenge. And they also need a solution. Okay? So that's that kind of positive negative thing. And of course, we've talked a lot about the classical mess sort of idea and the, and the essays around that and so on. But he used his body as a means to demonstrate his point, not just writing, okay? which he, of course, also did. And these are now enshrined, but if you actually watch, and there's uh, a very good paper by, uh, an old paper by Avolio and Gardner who talk about um, the performance of charisma in an interactional sense. So if we're sat in an interview or something like that and how you actually do it and how good charismatic leaders are very skilled performers. Lee's acting background clearly he used very effectively to develop this. Um, and if you watch that interview with, uh, on the Pierre Burton show, it's, it's fantastically uh, put across. And it's, it's all about the embodiment, actually. You know. And he did it in the Hornet as well, didn't he? So his body underpins his uh, presentation of his, of his philosophy very strongly. OK. So I've got 40 seconds. <laughs> One minute. Okay. Um, a few summary points, really, I wanted to make. Charisma's not innate. Theoretically, uh, following Wallace's really important peep, uh, intervention, the notion that charisma is relational, culturally uh, uh, constructed and contextual. Okay? Bruce Lee saying what he said, doing what he does, right now, would he break through? Okay? And so are the effects of charisma. I think Lee reflected the zeitgeist of his time. You know, he was a product and an active catalyst for the cultural opening, globalization, ethnic transformations that were already occurring in East and West. And he was uniquely situated. 
as being a member of both, and he knew enough about both. As such, his audience, particularly the Western one, was receptive to being awakened okay, to, to these sort of what I might call non-rational alternatives, alternatives that go outside the Western norm um, that people had already lived through. They were ready to be inspired. They wanted someone. Okay, just final point. Um, but for me, his real legacy was the way in which he lived and embodied this popular Taoist philosophy that he reinvented and advocated. Okay? And the way in which he appealed um, through his charismatic um, body to encourage agency for everyone who wished to hear his message. And that's what I think is encapsulated so well in this idea of don't think, feel. Okay. Thank you very much.